So if you've been watching these thermochemistry videos, you'll recognize that there's a couple of ways that we can put a value to the enthalpy change in a chemical reaction. One of those ways is we can take empirical, that is experimental data, using calorimetry, and we can figure out what the overall enthalpy change is for a given chemical reaction that we can perform in the lab. But there's lots of instances where it's not really easy to perform some of these reactions in a laboratory setting, especially in a high school laboratory setting, and we have to use another way. We can use something called Hess's Law. If you've watched the previous video and realized that we can take already established thermochemical equations, rearrange those equations and their enthalpies, and figure out the overall enthalpy change for a target equation. The third and final way is to take an application of Hess's Law and utilize something called heats of formation to figure out what the overall enthalpy change for a given chemical reaction is going to be. So a formation equation represents the overall enthalpy change for the formation of one mole of a substance from elements in their standard states. Now, how do we know what the standard states of elements are? Well, if you take a look at most periodic tables, most of those elements, at least in terms of how they're represented in their states, occur at standard conditions. So for some periodic tables it might look like a symbol of what state that element's found in, or for some other periodic tables it might look like the color of the elemental symbol is different depending on the state that it's found in. So the way that a formation equation is put together is we take a particular compound, like say calcium carbonate, and we break it up into the elements that make it up. So rather than it being a dissociation equation, we don't break it up into calcium ions and carbonate ions, rather we break it up into calcium, carbon, and oxygen. Now the important thing for formation equations is that this is a representation of one mole and one mole only. Now elements in their standard states, especially diatomic gases like oxygen, are found as O2. So in order to balance out formation equations, we're going to find that we have to use fractional coefficients. And fractional coefficients are okay here because we're not representing one single calcium carbonate unit. What we are representing is a mole of calcium carbonate. So to have a fraction of a mole is certainly acceptable. To have a fraction of an element or a fraction of a molecule, uh, not so much. But in the case of formation equations, fractional coefficients are okay when balancing for one mole of a substance. Now what you're going to notice for formation equations is that a lot of these elements have negative values, that is most of them are exothermic. And what that tells you is that for a lot of these compounds, they're far more stable as compounds than they are as individual elements. So most of the enthalpy changes that you're going to see are going to be negative. That said, there are some positive values for these formation equations. Now how do we use these formation equations in a target equation to figure out what the overall enthalpy change is? Well, we can use an application of Hess's law. And what's observed is that if we take the sum of the enthalpy changes for the products and subtract the sum of the enthalpy change for the reactants, we can come up with the observed enthalpy change for a target equation. And we can represent that mathematically in this equation. So yeah, you are going to have to know an equation to use these formation equations in order to establish the overall enthalpy change for a target reaction. But like most things, I think the best way to do this is to take a look at an example. And we can take a look at a really common example that occurs all around us, at least where there's photosynthetic material. Let's take a look at photosynthesis and the overall enthalpy change that is observed using heats of formation for the compounds involved. So for our example, we're going to take a look at the photosynthetic production of glucose and just what the overall enthalpy change is going to be using the standard enthalpies of formation for the compounds involved. So you'll notice on the reactant side, we have six moles of carbon dioxide reacting with six moles of liquid water. And it is important to note the states, because the states of these particular compounds lead to different enthalpies of formation. We also have one mole of glucose being formed and six moles of oxygen gas. Now what's important to note is that oxygen gas is already in its standard state. So its overall enthalpy change is actually going to be zero. But if we take a look at the other compounds, they are not elements in their standard states, so we do have to figure out the heats of formation. Now we can either look up the heats of formation, or we can be provided with the heats of formation. So in this particular instance, we're going to be provided with the heats of formation for each one of these, and then we're going to apply our overall equation to establish what the overall enthalpy change is going to be. So we can see that we have one mole of glucose, and we can see that the heat of formation of glucose is negative 1,260 kilojoules per mole. We're going to multiply this by one mole, and then we are going to close off the brackets, because remember oxygen does not contribute to our overall enthalpy change calculation because oxygen is a molecule already in its standard state. 
we are then going to subtract 6 moles times the enthalpy change of the carbon dioxide, or the heat of formation of carbon dioxide, which is negative 393.5 kilojoules for water. It's going to be 6 moles times 285.8 kilojoules, because again, these are kilojoule per mole values, and we have 6 moles respectively of each carbon dioxide and water. We're going to plug it into our overall equation, and we are going to find that the overall sum of the heat of formation and the overall enthalpy change for this reaction is going to be 2816 kilojoules. So it should not be a surprise that photosynthesis is an endothermic process, that is we have a positive delta H, because remember energy has to be input into photosynthesis through the form of sunlight in order for this reaction to proceed. So as you can see, it's a little bit more condensed than using Hess's law and algebraically rearranging equations to establish an overall enthalpy change, but it is just as acceptable. Now you might be wondering, well, why can't I just use this every single time instead of using Hess's law or using calorimetry? And the reality is you've got to remember that most of the time we are dealing with these heats of formation under standard conditions. And there's a lot of reactions that don't occur under standard conditions. So we have to use tables of already established values or we have to conduct the experiments ourselves. The important thing to understand is that there are three separate ways that we can come up with the overall enthalpy change for a target reaction. and you should, if knowing all of the introductory concepts in thermochemistry, be able to use all three ways to solve for the enthalpy change of a given reaction. Thanks for watching.